So we've got a couple hundred individuals here today um, from all corners of the beer industry, really. Uh, we've designed what I think is probably one of our most interesting programs to date. Um, in addition to diving into some familiar subjects like mergers and acquisitions, marketing and branding decisions, growth strategies, uh, and touching on other industry-wide challenges, we'll be moving beyond today, uh, moving beyond craft beer, that is, and discussing things like marijuana, distilled spirits, and hard cider. Um, this is an important departure from some of our previous conferences where we've really been focused squarely on discussing what's going on within the craft beer category. But as the industry continues to evolve and as the businesses operating within it begin looking for creative ways to grow, um, we must evolve the program as well. So if we ignored subjects like marijuana or we failed to recognize the increasing number of beer companies that are adding spirits or cider lines to their portfolios, we'd be doing all of the entrepreneurs in the space and here today a disservice. And let's face it, the industry's changing, times are changing. There are nearly 5,000 craft breweries in operation, established craft brands are struggling to grow, small craft brewery tap rooms are booming, big companies like Anheuser-Busch, Miller Coors, Constellation, and Heineken are now seriously invested in the space, Key executives at places like New Belgium, Ballast Point, Duval, Stone, Sweetwater are coming and going. Some regional craft breweries are finding it tougher to grow and retrenching back to their local markets as a result. Regulators are more, are more closely monitoring the competitive or anti-competitive activity in the space. And all of this is happening at a time when industry-wide growth is slowing and as the world's largest beer company has just swallowed up its next closest competitor. So where does that leave craft brewery entrepreneurs? It leaves them with an incredible opportunity to fine tune their businesses so they are well positioned to grow into the future. It leaves them with a chance to explore creative areas of growth. It leaves them with a chance to revisit their branding, to revisit their marketing, to revisit their whole reason for being as they look to thrive in a marketplace that has evolved and will continue to evolve in 2017. And that's why, with you guys here today, we've designed the program that we have. And to kick things off this morning, while everyone is uh, hopefully alert, even after a wonderful welcome reception last night, we've got two chief economists, two of the finest in the, in the industry, um, really pretty much the only two that I know, I think, <laughs> um, Bart Watson and Lester Jones. Um, when we first began hosting this event five years ago, uh, the majority of headlines that we were writing uh, as it pertained to industry growth, uh, touted nothing but impressive double-digit gains uh, for the craft sector and many of the companies within it. Uh, but the increasing number of category entrants has finally begun taking its toll on the industry's largest and most established players. And at the same time, headlines about industry-wide performance have changed too. We're no longer talking about 20% increases in volume. Instead, we're hearing more about a craft slowdown. And back in March, Bart had this to say, <clears throat> about so softer category trends. As the industry matures and moves into the mainstream, slower growth is a natural part of that maturation. That's what he told us back in March. In May, he told us that a craft slowdown was real, but more heavily impacting the larger brands. And since, we've seen a number of those br brands blame poor sales on stiffer competition. And although large brands stand the most to lose as category-wide volume slow, regional breweries and microbreweries should still take heed. So today, Bart, joined by his counterpart, Lester Jones from the NBWA, will unpack some of the more interesting data points from 2016, and over the next 40 minutes, they'll discuss the latest category trends, they'll discuss the growth of taproom sales, they'll identify new growth opportunities um, and, and where they'll exist as mature markets get more saturated, and they'll explain how brewers should consider navigating a rapidly changing landscape. So, without further ado, I'll remove myself from the stage now and call up Bart and Lester. Big round of applause for these guys. Thanks, Chris. Yep. There's a clicker. There's a clicker. As promised. You got it? I got it. All right. Bart's in charge of the clicker. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks to Brewbound for having us. Uh, we're excited to be here. Yeah, so uh, we're going to crunch the numbers this morning. As you can see, Bart has the good posture. I'm the one with the slouch. That's just what happens when you spend all day at the computer. Uh, so we're going to kick off today talking about kind of just doing some top 10 lists just to get things warmed up. 
Uh, Danny Brager from Nielsen was kind enough and his team were kind enough to give us some 52-week uh, data. This is 52 weeks all in through November and gives us kind of an idea of what's happening in the industry. So right off the bat, you know, on the, you know, on the side that says top 10 largest volume for all beer, we took all the big brands in there, Bud Light, Coors Light, and what you get here is just the idea that things are a little unpredictable. Uh, some things are up, some things are down. You can see the classic brands that you know, we've, we've seen uh, declining over the years, still going, but then some of these other brands like Coors Light uh, you know, has a little bit of life in it. Uh, and you work down the list, you can kind of see just how much change is going on in the industry. Yeah, and if we look over at the craft-specific side, and I'll note that this is the Nielsen craft definition, so it would include uh, non-independent brewers as well. That's, you know, hence Blue Moon on top there. Um, but you, this is a very different slide than we would have seen um, a couple of years ago. Obviously, there's a lot more red on this side of the ledger than there has been in the past, and, you know, I think this is a good synopsis of what we've, we've seen in craft where the overall industry is still growing, um, but certainly, you know, regional craft brewers and the top brands are, are facing challenges both from above and from below. Yeah. Um, we'll get a little bit more, we'll see some of these trends a little bit more when we get into some of the new brands and some of the growth uh, that's going on. Uh, but you can also see some, some changes going on here in terms of, you know, what's growing and what's not. Seasonals, uh, the two seasonals on there obviously have had a very tough year and that's been wider problem uh, for the craft industry. Yeah, and looking at this, uh, taking the list, this is kind of like, think of all the brands and sorted different ways. This sort right here takes the largest volume gains for the 52-week period. So on the top 10 largest volume for all beer, you can kind of see, you know, the story that we've seen all year with Michelob Ultra being kind of one of those big uh, winners in the marketplace right now with almost 10 million cases added in the 52-week period. And then you can work your way down that list as well. You see some surprises in there in terms of just how much additional volume was added by these top 10 brands in the industry. Uh, a couple things to note on the craft side here. You know, the first is that obviously craft is still a much more diffuse category. Uh, while a lot of these brands have gotten much larger, you know, the ones that are adding volume, um, you know, we have one, you know, that would, is almost cracking the top 10 list there. Founders of the case equivalent added is just below, or I guess it's actually just on there. Yeah. It's number nine number on nine. there. Um, so, so they're starting to crack the top 10 list, um, but still obviously, the growth is coming from a lot more places um, than these overall brands. Um, also note, you know, and I, I think here it's actually useful that we're using, you know, the Nielsen uh, brand definition uh, rather than the BA, because I think it points to some of the challenges that independent brewers are facing uh, when we see, you know, a number of, uh, of large brewer brands. You know, Goose Island popping up on this list has been one of the challenges that obviously regional craft brewers have faced, that the large brewers have made big bets in this space, and, um, you know, given their resources, they're, they're being very successful here. So, um, you know, Last thing to point out uh, before we move on to the next one that I think is interesting here is, you know, if we did this a couple of years ago, this would be all IPAs. Um, you know, now we're still having, you know, a lot of IPAs on the list, but we're starting to see some of the more sessionable offerings. And, you know, Firestone 805 yeah. is, is clearly kind of a new direction for craft that I think we're going to see more brewers take as they look for greenfield spaces because it's something a little bit different and obviously taps into uh, the larger beer drinker market that, that craft brewers are going to need to get into if they're going to be successful in the coming years. Yeah, and then next, uh, the next uh, top 10 list is kind of the brands that weren't here last year, but are now suddenly here. And in both comms, in both tables here, you kind of see a lot of the same brands, but for the all beers, you got the mix of the, uh, the imports and uh, some of the FMBs that have popped up. But once again, you know, you can look at those volume gains and you can see that being big kind of helps you bring a lot of beer into the market. So the, uh, the New Belgium uh, won there, what, 507,000 cases. You know, that's brand new for this year in terms of getting the beer to market. So a couple of interesting things when we compare the craft list. First is that this is the first one that isn't really that different. So we look at the craft list and we look at the all beer list. In terms of the new brands, we see that craft is still really an innovation point for the beer industry, that a lot of these new brands are coming from, from craft brewers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of, you know, what new brands are hot, you know, we could maybe try to, to pull together some trends here, you know, certainly flavored variants of things that were very popular this year, you know, we have, you know, kind of coffee and we have some of the fruit, but, um, you know, if, if I'm a media member in the room, I mean, I, I challenge you to write a headline that captures the diversity of these 10 brands on the craft side. It's, um, it's pretty amazing how many different directions, and I think that also points to one of the challenges. If we look at you know, craft a few years ago, it was pretty clear if you moved into IPA, you were going to find growth. And now we're seeing, again, a much more diffuse growth 
Um, these styles are very different. Um, you know, we've got, a we've got a couple of nitros in there. We've got you know, flavored IPAs. And, and then we've got a pills. Um, and last but not least, you know, something to keep in mind, it's not huge. It's only uh, 95,000 cases on there. Uh, but Trouble is sorted. That's, that's Walmart's private label brand. Um, so that's a change. We haven't ever really seen private label play big in the beer business or, or particularly in the craft business. But um, you know, it's on a top 10 of, of new, new brands on there. And uh, if we see more like that, that could pose a lot of challenges for, for brewers in the room. Absolutely. Click. All right, so everyone keeps asking about the bubble and when's it going to burst. And uh, for us at MBWA, we've been kind of tracking what beer purchasers do. And what we do with the beer purchases index is every month we basically ask beer purchasers, are you adding more, buying more beer, about the same beer, or less beer? This isn't really that scientific. It's not a scale. It's just a thumbs up, thumbs in the middle, and thumbs down. And what we really saw was kind of the craft segment for beer purchasers, at least in the distributed network, that kind of peaked in July of 2015. And so that was kind of like the industry's peak point when we were like, most of the people were saying, I'm ordering more beer. And what's happened since then is that more and more distributors are reporting that they're ordering about the same beer. Now, that doesn't mean they're ordering less beer or ordering more beer. It just means they're about the same. I don't ask them to do calculations. This is a quick market check that we use uh, on our side to just see where the directions of all the segments are going. And really what we've seen is that since July of 2015, it's just kind of been slowing down a little bit. It's just a slow, gradual maturation of an industry because things are filling up, and that's what happens when space fills up. Yeah. So uh, just real quick, if you look at this index, you know, 50 is an important mark for you know, the Purchases and Managers Index or any of the kind of the manufacturing indices, indices that you see out there. So like basically an index of 50 or greater basically means the industry is expanding or the segment is expanding, and an index below 50 kind of gives you an indication that things are contracting. You know, this craft index for this is still positive. It's still above 50, so things are still growing, and we just see it not as strong as it was in the past. Uh, so just, you know, we do this every month, so it is out there, and uh, feel free to call me and talk to me about it if you wish. Great. So, you know, continuing on this idea, you know, it, we all heard that there are way too many SKUs. And if you look over time, yes, industry SKUs have been growing rapidly. You know, based on the 2014 data that we did, we saw it well over 1,000 uh, SKUs per distributor on average. And at the same time, those in in inventory turns have been slowing down, going from 17 in 2006 down to about 14 in 2014. So once again, this is just the natural progression of an industry growing larger. At the same time, the total pie of beverage alcohol doesn't really change that much. So if we look at this over time, and you can look at this various ways, I mean, you know, the Gallup poll, they've been asking it for 80 years and about two-thirds of Americans yeah. drink. Um, and Americans also drink about the same amount of beverage alcohol. So this is beer, wine, and spirits. Beer is on the bottom. Beer used to have more than 50 share of total beverage alcohol, and here it's just been converted into, um, you know, into pure ethanol. So, you know, beer at 4.5% use. Yep. Um, um, and, and you can see that you know, what's happened in a lot of the beer industry's general problems in terms of volume haven't been um, because of you know, internal problems as much as competition from wine and spirits. And wine and spirits have pretty steadily been taking share. Um, you see it go up a little bit and down a little bit over time, and Les is going to talk about that in a second. Um, but you know, one of my core messages when I've been giving talks recently is you're not in the beer business, you're in the beverage alcohol business. And so understanding beer trends is great, but understanding broader beverage trends um, is increasingly important. Right. And we are competing for alcohol occasions against wine and spirits. And we do that as an industry, whether it's craft or whether it's light or whether it's you know, an FMB, where you are competing for drinking occasions. And if you look, if you did, that previous chart was from zero all the way up to two and a half gallons of ethanol per person per year. What I do here in this slide is I just zone right in on the, the two, two gallons or greater, 2.2 gallons or greater, and you can see a little bit of economic cycle in here. So if you look at 2001 to 2007, which was like our previous expansionary period, we didn't see that many more alcohol occasions come out of the alcohol beverage market. In fact, from 2001 to 2007, there was actually 28 more occasions over that entire time frame that people actually said, woohoo, good times are here, let's have a drink. And what happened, we had 2007, we had that recession, went through 2010, and 
people gave up a little bit of drinking. Don't let your grandfather tell you that people drink in good times and in bad times because it is an economic event. But what happened in 2010 is that we really didn't see any, any additional occasions come to the total alcohol beverage market, basically because we were basically trading up, not drinking more. We were drinking better during that time period, which is pretty indica is indicated by the growth in the high end. So even in 2010 to 2015, we're still kind of looking for some economic uh, boost to the total volumes that people drink. But once again, the economic cycle is only going to be very small for its impact. And at the same time, we've seen, these, we've seen a lot in the news that how traditional on-premise is down, and we can't hear it constantly how on-premise is dying. We see that in, uh, in some of the data that we get out of the industry. We also see it in basically the bars and taverns in the industry. People just aren't going to the classic places to drink anymore. Here in the little yellow bars are a count of the number of bars, traditional bars. These are establishments that primarily sell alcohol. You know, they don't rely on food for, for for the bulk of their revenue, they rely primarily on alcohol. So, but really what's happened over the last 10 years, we've literally lost millions of, uh, of uh, bars and taverns around the country. And this is data from the quarterly uh, census of employment and wages showing that we went from 44,000 in 2010 down to about 44,000. At the same time, obviously one of the big stories in craft has been that we've seen a lot of beer volume shift from you know, more traditional drinking establishments to breweries themselves. So this is data from the TTB, um, and they track three types of production from U.S. brewers in kegs, in package, and what they call premises use, which is data um, you know, where beer is served directly from bright tanks at a brewery. Um, and here's 2010 to 2016, um, and you can pretty clearly see the changes. Uh, for 2016, that blue line is through three quarters. So through three quarters this year, we've already passed the 2015 total. And I've added on what looks like about an average quarter so far in that gray bar to where we could get. Um, and this is now getting to um, about a percent of the overall beer business, or at least the U.S. domestic production, because th we also have imports, which are a little bit more than 30 million barrels now. Um, so it'll be a, maybe a little bit less than a percent of the overall beer business. But we're on pace to hit about 1.8 million barrels of premises use. And, and that's not the only um, thing that these breweries are selling. So here were my estimates in 2015, broken down by business model. Um, and last year, they had premises use at about 1.2 million barrels. Um, and I think there were at least another half million barrels that were sold in to-go sales, that were sold in kegs that people reported to the TTB as kegs, but they actually sold in their brewery, sold as growlers to go from breweries. Um, and so if we were at you know, 1.75 last year, um, and we've seen 600,000 in that premises use growth this year, um, it's quite plausible that we'll get to maybe 2.5 million barrels sold directly at breweries and brew pubs. Um, and you can see that this is very different by business model. So obviously the brew pub is a very, you know, at, at the brewery, own premise centered uh, business model. Microbreweries, it's a growing piece. We've seen that percentage go up. Um, and for regional craft brewers who are still primarily in packaging, you know, trying to move into wider distribution, it's still a very small piece of the pie. Um, but it's one that's been growing for all of these business models over time as we see some of those challenges in wider distribution and people look for a way to um, increase their margins and, and still have money to, to run their businesses. Yeah, and keep in mind that this is, this is really about the marketplace changing. This is about retail changing. This is about distribution changing. This is about an industry that's actually evolving and evolving pretty effectively and you know, in a market economy. And things are changing, things are evolving. So it's, it's important to see just how much change, not to repeat myself, that's happening across all three tiers of this industry and how in impactful it is to the businesses. And it's happening very, very quickly. So here I've just zeroed in on just the draft production piece of the TTB report. So again, this is just domestic breweries and wouldn't include imports, um, but that's still you know, the vast majority of the US beer business. And I picked out four years, 2005, 2010, 2015, and then this year. Uh, this year is again extrapolated based on three quarters. Um, and you can see there the premises use uh, versus the keg, so it's a, it's a growing share. And on the right there is the percentage. And you know, if I had one takeaway from this slide, you can see that percentage increase from 2010 to 2015 is about the same as the percentage increase from 2015 to 2016. So not only are things changing, but they're accelerating in how fast they're changing. So we're seeing now, this year, of US draft production, uh, between 9 and 10% of it is going to be served directly from bright tanks rather than going into kegs. And that's a pretty dramatic change in how the U.S. draft beer market works. And 
You know, from the data, there's no signs it's slowing down, though. You know, tr trends are trends until they're not. And we, and we like to think about data as we want it immediately. We want it now. We want it as quickly as we can get it. Unfortunately, you know, TTB takes a little bit of time to get this data. And also, once they close it out, it takes them a whole other year to kind of go back and clean things up. So it's almost like a whole other year before you really know what happened. So right now, we're coming near the end of 2016, and we're kind of making some estimates about what we think was happening. We're not going to know really how 2016 ended until 2017. So we've got to be really careful about what we say about the state of the industry. I see that a lot these days, that people are making some definitive statements based on, you know, not a complete picture of the industry, and you really need to wait till the total universe and all the data are in before you really start making definitive statements about what's happening. So, yeah, by, by December, Lester and I will make definitive statements about the industry in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, anyway, so listen, to, and this is great. I love this slide. I use this all the time. I used it you know, two years ago when we did this. It's, it's kind of really important for the alcohol beverage industry because I think the best times are ahead for us. And I say this for two reasons. One, the, green bu the little bubble up top there that represents the baby boomers whose kids are now coming out of college. They're kind of wiping their hands and saying, you're on your own. And at the same time, we have this bubble of millennials that we're all tired of hearing about. But once again, they're on their own. And that kind of means people are washing their hands of a lot of the responsibilities of parenthood in general, just relative to the population that's behind them. They're a little smaller, you see how they drop down, there's fewer of them in there. Each one of those bars represents how many people are in each age cohort in the U.S. population. So you can see the zero to one year olds, there's a little bit less than four million of them, and you work your way up till you get to those peak millennials where there's four and a half million of them, then you go back down to the 40 year olds and back up. In any event, what's important about this slide is that these, these groups are shifting and they're aging. And like I said two years ago, as they age, it means that these, the alcohol occasions that you saw in those previous slides are up for grabs. Because in a certain sense, they will develop different taste profiles, they'll look for different places to drink and different ways to drink, and it's up for everyone to go and get. I don't think it's locked and tight. I don't know if all the millennials are moving out. I did see a demographic group tried to sell me some data on uh, boomers and boomerangs the other day. <laughs> millennials who are living with their boomer parents, so. Great, well, we'll see. And so think about it. Here for this is Scarborough data. It comes from uh, the Scarborough research firm, which basically sends a diary to people's households, and they fill out all these questions about what they drink. One of the things they do is ask about what beer, wine, and spirits they drink. Typically, they say, have you had, a, have you had the opportunity to drink a spirit in the past seven days, or a beer in the past seven days, or wine in the past seven days? You can do this for 30 days or a year. Obviously, you're going to get different different numbers, but if you do the past seven days, you get the most likely drinkers out of that group of survey respondents. And what's incredibly interesting is how different those Gen Xers are from the Gen Ys. Uh, you can see the Gen X kind of preferred, the uh, index is 100, so if you're at 100, you drink just like everyone else in the po general population. If you're above 100, you tend to drink a little bit more than the general population. If you're below, a little bit less. That's kind of how you measure these, these, these indices. But what you see is there's clearly a radical difference between these four groups of, of consumers. So uh, for Gen Ys, they tend to drink liquor and beer equally, right? And that kind of surprised all the big brewers a few years ago, because while they were waiting for all those millennials to come of age and turn legal drinking age, they thought they were kind of theirs, because they looked at the Gen Xers and said, ooh, look, they prefer beer, so this generation is going to behave the same way. Oops. Not so. It was radically different. And, you know, the, the, the still spirits industry did a pretty good job at changing a lot of, of ways that liquor was sold in the industry, and that kind of helped them introduce spirits and liquor into this Generation Y in a little bit more aggressive way than it was with the Gen X. But no matter how you look at it, you know, the wine is kind of a little lower for Gen Ys. Uh, uh, liquor and beer is higher. But you work your way down, you can see the boomers are obviously moving quickly into wine tend to prefer that. Uh, and then silent generation, obviously, much more wine consumers, too. I don't know why they call them silent. My granddad sure in the heck ain't that silent. And, and I'll add on here, too, that there's, there's two things going on. Obviously, there's differences between these generational mm -hmm. cohorts just off the bat, but there's also time. And, you know, so the silent generation, if you looked at them when they were 21 to 29, those, you know, obviously those spirits and beer columns would be higher. And, you know, part of what the beer industry needs to think about and do going forward is think about, you know, over time, you know, Gen Y aren't 
they don't always have to drink that level of spirits. They yep. may move more into beer and wine going forward in ways that the beer industry can engage with them and ensure that as they age and we see these curves change, as they always do, because people change their drinking habits as they get older, um, that we can make sure that they transition into beer rather than transitioning you know, into wine as we've seen some previous generations right. do. So go back one. So guys, look at this picture one more time. Let's go back to that, go, go backwards. Now think about those two bubbles as they move this way down the timeline. So that, like I said, these opportunities for drinking occasions are going to change. And the big question here is, are these Gen Y people, are they going to keep those same consumption patterns as they move into that next age cohort? And are the baby boomers going to do the same thing as they move into that, na that next age cohort? I don't think that story is written. You can, people ask me all the time, what's the prediction for 10 years down the line? I'm like, well, it really depends on what these groups do as they shift down, because that's going to drive their expectations of where the market is actually going to be when we're done. All right. Okay, here we go. We are getting older, right? We, ha we are getting older as a country. The legal drinking age share of the population is getting close to 75. Three out of every four people in this country are going to be over the age of 21. The corollary here, obviously, is the median age is going up. And at the same time, give me a flip on the slide, please. Our household sizes are getting smaller, and our birth rates are going down, which basically means millennials aren't having the baby boom that we would expect, that little echo boom that you would expect from this new generation coming of age. I think that has profound <laughs> impacts for our, for, our, for our industry because both the baby boomers are getting older, they're getting close to retirement, they're getting ready to hit leisure world, the millennials are entering the workforce, they're not having children, they're not forming households, they've got a lot more time to be out having good times. That's why it's going to be a good time to be in the beer industry in the next five years. And, and I'll add that you should look at this. You know, this data is very easy to get from the U.S. Census Bureau. And if you email Lester or I, we can certainly help you find it. You know, but look at this for your state, too, because that percentage has profound implications you know, that Lester already talked about, but also regulatory implications in particular states. When you have a high percentage of people who are 21 plus, you know, people don't have that, you know, uh, uh, you know, that what about the children attitude when they're thinking about regulation. When you see that percentage go up, and we have seen a few little bublets in some of the states. Some if you of the look states, at the states have little baby boomers. Where suddenly that, tw that 21 po plus population goes down and next thing you know, you know, we've won a lot of regulatory freedoms as small brewers in recent years, but that can always swing back. And so keeping an eye on this and the demographics and how that plays out in, in regulatory terms is always important, you know, and, and is very, very state specific because you get these national trends, but they can be very, very different place to place. So at the same time, if you think about it, we've had this, we've really been looking at the high end and the high end is kind of like, why, we're, we're in this economy where we read all the news where wages aren't growing, and you know, we're just, the good times just weren't what they used to be. But at the same time, households are getting, getting smaller because we're not having as many children. And the Urban Institute did a great study on this when they looked at the share of, of uh, percentage of the U.S. population by income class between 1979 and 2014. And what they found is once you adjust the household income for household side, you know, 4.2 people in 1979, 3.8 in 2014, the amount of money available to the household actually goes up because there's fewer people to spend it across. And what that means is that the upper middle class in this country between 1979 and 2014 virtually doubled because the household sizes dropped which leaving more money for these people to spend on things like high-end beer, wine, coffee, tea, cupcakes, chocolate. Uh, we can keep going on. Yeah. But anyway, we know the story of how the high-end has just gone the way it has over the last couple of years. And really, it is a function of changing demographics coupled with the income equation. And that's what you see in this slide from Beer Markers Insights. It's the long view. It looks to 1980, pretty close to 1979. But back then, the premium high end was less than 10% of the market. One out of 10 beers was considered above premium. Leap forward to 2014, you're looking at a premium market, which is more than a third of the market. And that's the power of that demographic shift and that income shift associated with the size of the household. And this isn't something that's this isn't something that's new um, in the beer business. 
You know, we've seen these huge shifts over time. You know, if we look historically, and this is a combination of that, that same data from Beer Markers Insights as well as some, uh, some data from Robert Weinberg, you know, and we look at this, you know, if we look at these huge shifts, the rise of the premium brands, we call them premium because they were the high end of the market. You know, the big brands that we know today coincided with the decline of other brands, um, the old regional brands and value brands, and we saw the shift. And, you know, in fact, if we go back even further historically, I mean, those brands were the rise against other smaller local brands, as we saw the, the nation you know, consolidate around these bigger lager brands. Um, so this is a cycle that we've had before. And you can see that today, you know, I've added here you know, the, the kind of segment three, as I call it, you mm -hmm. know, the next wave of craft, import, super premium, FMB. And you can see that it's starting along a similar curve when we saw that premium rise before. Um, and you know, will it get to that height where it's you know, 65 to 70% of the beer market you know, remains to be seen, but you know, in some places, we're starting to get up there, and um, the data did not come through for the numbers here, unfortunately. Um, but this is US, Colorado, and California. And I've just taken um, the high end again, so imports, super premium, uh, craft, you know, FMBs, cider, and I've lumped them all together. And this is their volume share and scan data in those various states. Um, and if we had the numbers on top, uh, you, can, you can put them over the cell range there. Uh, you can see that you know, in t from 2011 to 2015, all grew between 2 and 3% annually. Um, so they were all growing you know, pretty steadily. We were seeing that high end move up. Um, in 2016, Colorado's basically stopped growing. It's a little bit up, but it's basically flat. Um, you know, the overall beer business is, is, is a little bit up in Colorado, uh, but the high end has basically stopped. And you know, it's hit 50% of the volume. And you know that means more like 65% of the dollars. Yeah. How um, much high end can you have? How, exactly. You know, <laughs> when we see if we go back, you know, <laughs> these things hit a certain point, and then something new comes along and, and replaces them. And you know, we'll, we'll see what that is. You know, maybe it's you know super early, locally sourced, organic. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things to think about. Kind of what's next. Um, but you know, there's only a certain, you know, only as Lester is fond of saying, you know, only, only a certain percentage of people can drink champagne. Um, Dom Perignon. Dom Perignon. Sorry. We can all drink champagne. Yeah. Uh, okay. But also, you know, it's like great inflation. You know, we all can't have A students. Someone's got to be a. Yeah. Someone's got to get a C on the exam. And California was still growing 2%. It's still growing 2% plus this year in these high-end categories. Um, but it's also getting pretty close to where Colorado is. And so it is something to keep in mind you know, in your state. You know, how big is the high-end and how much bigger can it get? Um, obviously, in the overall US, I think there's a lot of room for growth still. Um, but this is really a market-by-market market question. It's, you know, you, you can't, if you're in your market, you're not going to be able to sell US statistics. You're going to be selling against the statistics that are in your market. All right. Now for the fun stuff. And that's right. So let's go for a ride because, you know, we got the high end here. We have people living in the high end. We have lots of brewers. We have lots of different ways of getting beer to market. We have lots of different places to drink it. And really, when you, what you see is it's, it's really the good times ahead, I think, for the industry. Um, so, so, but the industry is going to be consistently changing. So, you know, even if the high end flattens, you know, we're still going to continue to see shifts in how people consume alcohol, you know, where they drink beer and when. And um, this is some, some data from Nielsen that we do in an insights uh, poll that we do every year. And we ask people, you know, where are you consuming? You know, where are you consuming craft? Um, and, you know, still at home, at a friend's home is still the most popular. But you see, you know, those growing occasions are very different than the ones that are down versus a year ago. And the ones that are down versus a year ago are more kind of the traditional channels we think of. You know, eating out, um, going to a bar club. And the ones that are growing are, you know, this new experiential economy that you hear a lot about, but it's, you know, a little bit harder to wrap your head around. But, you know, it's drinking beer at the zoo. It's going directly to a brewery. It's going to a festival. Um, you know, the premises use doesn't include festivals. So we threw in festivals. Festivals. How much volume is that taking away from traditional bars and restaurants when you look at those on-premise numbers? You know, so you know, we take on-premise numbers with a grain of salt because part of what we're seeing is that we've seen a huge shift in the way people consume where they want to have a beer with whatever they're doing. And you know, whether that's the art museum or a festival or you know, an art walk, um, they're finding ways to integrate beer into those occasions that aren't necessarily showing up in, in traditional bars and restaurants. And it's an amazing time to see that shift, you know, in light of the Surgeon General's report and other things that are out there where, you know, I think the population in general is ready to go out and have a good time, and you see things coming that kind of are trying to tamper that down. So. And these are obviously also important opportunities to build your brand, yeah. engage with people in a way that, you know, going to a bar is difficult. You know, a festival is, is a very different event and, and certainly allows some new opportunities as well.
even if it creates challenges. Um, there are more of these than ever. Um, this is from a couple of months ago, so you know it's already 200 breweries behind. Um, but um, there are all the breweries in the country. Um, you can see that, that basically where there are people, there are breweries. 78.5% um, um, of 21 plus adults live within 10 miles of one of those dots. So the vast majority of the US population has access um, to, to local beer and local breweries. Um, here's a zoom in of where we are now. So there's, there's kind of, you know, um, far southern California, basically as far north as Temecula on the left, and then I've zoomed into the immediate um, San Diego area. So, you know, basically any way you head out of here, you're going to pass by uh, a, a number of breweries. We're in one of the densest areas around. Um, and as a closing point, I wanted to say that, you know, we are moving to a period with slower growth. I think, you know, everyone needs to wrap your head around that. The first challenge of slowing growth is to accept that there is slowing growth. Um, but even flat markets still have growth. It just means that, you know, whereas in a super fast growing market, maybe every part of the market is going up, now we're exchanging parts of the market going up for parts going down. If you've looked at this in styles, you know, IPAs are still flying, uh, but seasonals have had a very, very tough year. Um, and here I've, I've suggested, you know, a few areas. On the left, um, these are seven styles that, that Nielsen asked people, what was your preferred uh, beer style? Um, and this is indexed by gender. And so these are the seven styles where women over-index the most relative to men. Um, on the top is sour American wild ale. Next is fruit vegetable pumpkin. And there's herb spice. I'm reading these because I know the words are very small. Uh, Shandy Radler, Hefeweizen, Blonde Golden Ale, and then Saison Farmhouse. And these are all areas where uh, female drinkers said, I prefer this style, this is my preferred style, at a much higher rate than men did. And Six out of these seven styles have seen growth in 2016. You know, part of getting the beer business back to a really strong, robust growth place is going to be thinking about the new growth opportunities that broaden the demographic, that bring in new people, that get more people excited about beer occasions. You know, we've talked a lot about you know, the changing beer occasions. You know, engaging new people is going to require thinking about styles in a different way and thinking about the beer business generally in a different way. So, um, you know, local was another big part of this. But also, but also on that, keep in mind, go back to those original charts that we started with on the drinking occasions. Those drinking occasions are pretty darn fixed. So not only are you, not only are your styles com competing amongst each other for, a, for an occasion, you're competing against the rest of the beer market for occasions, and now you're p competing against wine and spirits for a relatively fixed number of occasions. It's gonna be a tough, it's gonna be a tough road to fight. This is about competitive marketplace looking for occasions for beer, and the styles are actually competing this with the styles as is the, within the industry and across the segments. Yeah, but, but Lester brings up a great point, which is that too, you know, some of these new things may play in different occasions, and they may provide new opportunities to take occasions back from wine and spirits that we haven't done a very good job of. And, you know, clearly we've been losing occasions to particularly spirits in recent years, and you know, maybe sour and wild ale can push back on some of those. Maybe it works better in a, you know, a food setting, or you know, could, some of these can play where a cocktail would play. So um, yep. important things to keep in mind. The other obvious one that's been driving uh, real big changes and you know, where we see growth is local. Um, so here's craft um, versus overall beer versus wine versus spirits. Not only is, is local important as part of the purchase decision to two thirds of, of craft purchasers, but it's even more important for that 21 to 34 year old group who, you know, preferences aren't fixed, so that may change, but they're going to be a big, important part of the beer business. If you remember Lester's demographic chart, is that little wave rides forward. And by every indication, new 21 plusers coming online have this similar internalization of economic impact. You know, this is, we have, have a whole generation who, you know, really understands that, you know, buying local affects your economy in a very different way than, um, than other purchases. So, um, and this is showing up in sales. Um, here is the IRI scan data from San Diego. This data is a little bit old, but this trend would, would certainly show similar things where, and we could pick basically any market, major market in the country, and we could see similar trends here, where local is catching up with and surpassing non-local brands. And, you know, we go back to those very first slides where we started, and we look at the craft brands that are struggling a little bit this year. You know, many of them are, you know, very widely distributed. And what they're running up to, into is a whole bunch of markets that look like this where suddenly, you know, local brands get, a, you know, it's not the only reason, you know, people are still picking good beer, they're still picking on quality, they're still picking on flavor, 
But if they have two that they feel are equal on that, and one's local and one's not local, that's an important part of the purchase decision for two-thirds of craft purchasers. And this is playing out in, you know, on, in shelves and on taps all over the country, and that's certainly posing some challenges for brands that have very, very wide distribution. Anything you want to close with, Lester, before we, before we end? That, that's good. Uh, we have... Great, we got back to that. Chris we meant to, we meant to have the, uh, the old-timey picture at the end, too. But yeah, we forgot our yeah. uh, hero from Venice. Yeah, Dennis. William C. Gossett, the original... Uh, the original beer economist. Beer geek. Be beer, beer numbers geek. Uh, ready to do some questions? Yeah, let's do some questions. No, let's do some awesome. questions. Awesome. 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 Pretty close on our time, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah we can have a nice. seat on the couch right. if you guys want. Anywhere? So uh, I will take a moment, actually, before we... Uh, fire off some questions. If you guys have questions, you can send them up here. I'll get them on this iPad. Um, on all of your agendas, there should be instructions, but you can text, tweet, or email. Email ask at brewbound.com. Uh, you can text uh, this number 858-212-0052 or use the hashtag BBSession on Twitter, and I'll get it up here. Um, and I should also note, because we get this question every single year, uh, these slides will be available uh, after the conference, so we will send them out to you guys uh, either at the end of the day tomorrow or early tomorrow morning. Um, so with that, uh, let's dive in. Certainly a, a lot of interesting stuff that you guys presented. Um, and I took down a couple questions myself, but um, you know, with, with so much of a beer company's business, you know, going back to some of the earlier slides, built around on-premise, and given how much you know, the uh, drinking occasions are changing, how can some of the largest players uh, you know, really drive drinkers back to the bar um, and start to kind of recapture some of those occasions you know, in a more traditional setting? So I would argue that you can't, you can't fight what people want. Um, and you should think less about driving people back to the bar and more about creating the type of brand engagement that people used to at the bar in the places where they're drinking now. And that there's still plenty of opportunities. I mean, if there was one kind of meta point, you know, from all of the draft data, it's that people are still going out and they're drinking. And if not as much, maybe more than they used to. And what's happened is how they're doing it has changed. And so now you've got to go out and you've got to engage with them at festivals. You've got to hold events. You've got um, you to you know, you have a tap room um, that you know, brings them in and gives them that brand experience in a way that you know, is more cultivated than it ever was at a bar. So I think it provides tremendous opportunities for people, but it's, it's different than it used to be. And, and also, people need to think about how they engage with people in the off-premise. You've got to build that brand in the off-premise, too. And that's a, that's a new challenge, but it's one that's going to be part of the industry going forward. Yeah, I mean, it really seems like uh, some of the larger companies are going to be a bit more challenged to capture those occasions. It seems like consumers are, you know, really into going into the, the local tap rooms, the very small tap rooms, and doing a lot of that drinking there. Um, so you, you had that stat about uh, draft beer being 9 to 10 percent uh, from, from the bright tanks themselves. Um, where do you see most of that happening? Is that happening uh, at the smaller, you know, microbreweries, or is it happening with some of the regionals as well? Uh, you know, all of the above. You know, certainly the majority of that volume, because it's very diffused, is it, you know, microbreweries and brew pubs where, you know, I mean, you've got 4,000 probably, you know, places to, to drink at a brewery around the country. Um, you know, but regionals are doing it too, and, you know, many of them have, you know, we've seen part of the design of a lot of the new breweries has been, you know, a, a brew pub experience, you know, tying that in with tours. Um, you know, we did some other work with Nielsen in our uh, insights panel about, you know, what percentage of people are more likely to purchase a brand once they've gone on a tour. Um, and it, it's pretty incredible the amount of people who say, I'm much more likely to buy beer from a, a brewery once I've visited the brewery. And so, you know, if you're, you know, you're a larger, you're a regional craft brewery, you know, invest in your tour, invest in your tasting experience. I mean, that's, that's one of the places to build brands that used to be, you know, in the bar, and, and now it's shifted in how people want to do that. And I don't think you're going to drive people back to the old ways. People consume the way they consume, and so it's about, you know, seeing what people are doing differently and, and then shifting your behavior. Right. right. But, it's, but what's good for the goose is good for the gander, so we do see the larger brewers uh, getting into this game as well. I mean, Anheuser-Busch is purchased a number of brew Absolutely. pubs around the country. Yep. Ballast Point has plans to, put, to run brew, uh, uh, brew pubs out there. And at some point, you know, you, you, you significantly change the way the market is because, you know, you have, you have an emergence of a tied house, which is a problem for choice, variety, and selection, and everything else out there. Is what one thing you really want to make sure you have the three-tier system out there. And, and that was going to be one of tight. the questions I asked you, um, and one of the questions that we actually received, you know, uh, fr from a guest here, 
um, you know, where does tap room end and Tide House begin? And, you know, I guess I'd sort of add on to that. Where does the NBA, NBWA stand with, regal, with regards to all of the tap room growth? Well, um, once again, I mean, it's, it's on pre it, this is on-premise consumption. Uh, this is beer that typically is not going through a three-tier system that's going right directly from a bright tank, you know, through the, the wall and into a consumer's cup. So uh, it's, you know, it's a problem in that it is slowing down the, the, the beer that flows through the three-tier system. Yep. Uh, and it is a question, where does this tap room, you know, end and the Tide House begin? At what point do customers come in and only have one choice of beer? Yep. And we pride ourselves on having lots of choices of beer whether it's on premise or off premise, if all of a sudden those choices, you know, we have so many tied, ha so many tap rooms competing amongst each other, and they start their, their, the off premise retailers around them start getting a little, a little put off because they're losing occasions there, and the other retailers, and you can have a very, you can have a backlash to this, and I think that's really where you don't want to see the choices that consumers have become reduced. Right, yeah. a little too much of a good thing. And, you know, and certainly every state is going to find the, the sensible balance that they think works for them, and you know, this will be locally decided. But you know, these are, I think, again, you know, it's important to stress, they can be good brand builders for the off-premise as well. And so if you find that right balance where you know, you're, not, you know, you're not destroying um, you know, retail, but you know, you're still helping people build brands, that you know, I think there's certainly going to be a place for these going forward, and, and that it's going to be an important part of the beer business for years to come. Yep. So I know we're just out of time here, but uh, out of all the data that you presented today, uh, for each of you guys, what are the most important, you know, one or two takeaways that folks here today should, you know, really take home with them and, and pay attention to if you had to pick one or two? I would say the story's not written. I, like I said, I think the shift in the, the demographic shift that we're seeing, the, we're, wait, we're waiting for both a massive retirement of baby boomers to hit the market. What are they going to do in the leisure world? How are they going to consume alcohol beverages? And at the same time, where do these millennials go? And like I said two years ago, will millennials sit down in cubes and have babies and start buying diapers and see their waist expand a little bit and start drinking light beer again? You know, these are all things that are possible. I don't think it's written in stone, and that's the beauty of this marketplace is that it's kind of up for grabs. Yep. Bart, your, your one or two takeaways? I, I would just say that the way that people are consuming beer um, is constantly changing and, and is fundamentally changed. So if you're still thinking about the beer business from five years ago and hoping it will come back, um, that, that's done. It's, you know, we've moved, we've moved to a new place, and so, um, you know, understanding some of the, the trends in, you know, where consumption happens um, and, you know, this fracturing of, of, of brands, you know, people just need to accept it um, and, and then start thinking about where their brands fit and where they can still grow within yeah. it. Because I think there's still tremendous opportunities for growth. They're just different than they were five years ago. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Great. Yeah. Thank Big you, Chris. round of applause. Thank you.